Jacob Simmons and Eden Ellingson. Ms. Ellingson teaches social studies at Albion Middle School in Sandy. Jacob is a junior at Brighton High School and has been one of Utah's top National History Day students since he began with the program in middle school. In high school, he has continued to compete in History Day as an independent student, which means he works on his own without a teacher. Jacob has competed at nationals for three years in the documentary category with projects on Yitzhak Rabin, Louis Grandis, and the Caribbean Jewish community of St. Eustatius during the Revolutionary War. Last year, Jacob and Ms. Ellingson were selected as fellows of the National History Day's Normandy Institute. They completed an intensive course of study on World War II during the spring and then spent a week in France where Jacob presented his research on one of Utah's silent heroes at the site of this soldier's grave. So please welcome Jacob and Lee. <laughs> Last October, Jacob came up to me. He was, I had him as an eighth grade student at, um, at Albion Middle School and he did a, he did he was my first full year of teaching. I came late to teaching and he was my first full year and such a remarkable student and a really fun student, really um, almost aggressively interested, <laughs> which I loved and um, really made teaching fun for me. So when he came back several years later and said he wanted to apply for this institute, I was like, I'm not going to ever try to hold you back, Jacob. So we entered this together and I wrote a paper and about how marvelous he is and a couple other things about my teaching style and he wrote papers as well and we were accepted and we found out last um, mid-December last year and little did we know what we were in for so we um, the history day and the Albert Small so it's Normandy sacrifice for freedom Albert H small student and teacher Institute and it was promoted by that um, the National History Day group so I became a part of this whole group that I had worked with with Jacob a little bit, worked with other few exceptional students on National History Day and really interested in it. And so to become in, just embraced by it has been amazing. So we took pretty much what was a college level class um, to get prepared for it. And we spent about five, six days in Washington, D.C. meeting with NARA researchers, researchers. I have a problem with language, so you'll be hearing that. But. Um, and she was a remarkable, helped us find all these wonderful things about um, World War II and about especially Normandy and our, our hero. And um, then we went to France for six days and visited every beach, every beach where there were allies that landed and learning from our instructors and developing eulogies and papers and a website for our gentleman, our silent hero. And that's kind of the background of our thing, of our, of our work. And David's going to actually introduce the man. OK, so uh, Albert H. Small, um, he's a wealthy philanthropist from Washington, DC. And one day, he noticed a problem that in America, he feared that our youth are losing a sense of what it meant to sacrifice for democracy, to sacrifice for freedom, um, to give us the life that we have today. So he created this program to educate the youth of our country who would uh, spread the word about a silent hero who's from their hometown and can teach us all lessons about sacrifice. And so one of the first things that uh, we noticed in our research about uh, our silent hero, John K. Lundberg, um, was a letter that he wrote to his family uh, upon being deployed overseas. And in this letter he wrote, Dear Mom, Pop, and Family, I'm sorry to add to your grief, but we of the United States have something to fight for. Never more fully have I realized that. 
the United States of America is worth the sacrifice. So in the, this clearly very eloquent, uh, charismatic letter that Lundberg wrote, um, it made me and Miss Ellingson ask the question of how did uh, uh, such an amazing young man and such an awful massive war that brought so many people together and tore so many people apart across the world, how did the two narratives of this war and of this man come together? And we found that it starts in 1918. So Germany and Adolf Hitler at that time, and I'm going to just show you a very short clip um, that I think does a good job. The humiliation of Germany's defeat and the peace settlement that followed in 1919 would play an important role in the rise of Nazism and the coming of a second world war just 20 years later. What shocked so many in Germany about the treaty signed near Paris at the Palace of Versailles was that the victors dictated a future in which Germany was deprived of any significant military power. Germany's territory was reduced by 13%. Germany was forced to accept full responsibility for starting the war and to pay heavy reparations. Too many, including 30-year-old former army corporal Adolf Hitler. It seemed the country had been stabbed in the back, betrayed by subversives at home, and by the government who accepted the armistice. In fact, the German military had quietly sought an end to the war it could no longer win in 1918. So the anger of Adolf Hitler is where it begins. All right, and then also going on during the same period of time, we have Churchill, who was inspecting a production line of heavy guns during uh, um, where he was Minister of Munitions. In 1918, we have Franklin Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, who also visited the front and checked, um, went very close and heard enough to feel the German artillery. And he used that as one of his excuses for being isolationist in the first part of World War II. Eisenhower was at Camp Colt, training people in Gettysburg, Virginia. Uh, and in Utah, on December 3, 1918, right after the end of World War I, John K. Lumberg is born to Grace and Frederick Lumberg of Valverde, Utah, which is just about 10 minutes north of here. Um, so he's a local boy. He's born right, um, it's about the Roaring Twenties are about to start. It's a really exciting time to be a baby born in America. Uh, life is looking good. His father is a successful electrical engineer and an accomplished inventor, and his mother is a talented pianist. Um, he's the ninth child born because his parents have each been divorced previously, so it's a big happy family with lots of talent, lots of potential, and it's an exciting time in American history. The 1930s for Germany and Adolf Hitler were, Hitler becomes chancellor. Germany hosts the Olympics, Jesse Owen wins four gold medals. Buchenwald concentration camp is open in, 19, in 1937. Germany annexes Austria. And the Kristallnacht happens in 1938 with the Night of Broken Glass, where widespread de destruction of Jewish homes, properties, and lives. And in 39, they invade Poland. President Roosevelt becomes president in the 30s. His historic 100 days, Social Security Act, Neutrality Act, where they try to stay out of any conflict, elected to a second term. The second Neutrality Act allows cash and carry, so they're dipping their toes into the water of helping the Allies. And he asks for a billion dollars for a two-ocean navy. And England as well. They first disarm, and then they build up. So they disarm their navy, and then they build up with 41 squadrons of the Royal Air Force. In Italy, France, and Britain, they discuss the rearmament of what Germany is doing. Edward, the, on the social front, Edward VIII abdicate, abdicates for Wallace Simpson. And then they, the Allies sign the Munich Agreement that gives land to Germany in their appeasement process. The kinder, um, kinder transport to Great Britain. And then Britain guarantees support of Poland. So as global tensions are rising in Europe and the Great Depression uh, hits the United States and the world. Uh, the Lundberg family also uh, suffers a small uh, depression of their own within their own home. 
as four of the nine children rapidly pass away, the first um, was uh, one of the ch children wanted to be a chemist and an experiment in his backyard went wrong. He produced a toxic gas and passed away. Um, this was John's older brother. Uh, the next child, Virginia, his younger sister, um, bought new shoes to go to her older brother's funeral. She got a blister from those shoes, and because there's no modest, modern medicine, uh, the infection from the blister killed her. And then two children, including an infant, quickly passed away after that. And so they're spending a lot of money on funerals at this point, and um, the cost of the funerals places enormous strain on the family, and the parents soon divorce. Um, and although there's divorce and death and illness going on in the family, Jack still seems to have a happy, vibrant childhood. He enjoys hiking in his backyard. Um, we read some of the essays that he wrote in school, and he has an amazing, uh, very mature prose for someone who is so young. Um, he always has a wide grin in his childhood photographs, and he somehow found time to get fluent in French, which um, we're still not sure how that happened. Um, <laughs> And then he, um, he managed, even though money was incredibly tight from the funerals, he attended the University of Utah, which he graduated from in 1940, shortly after the start of the war, with a degree in insurance. And while attending college, he worked as a janitor, in addition to getting his degree to support his mother. Um, and when he graduated, he was employed by the Fire Company Adjustment Bureau of Salt Lake City. While he was getting on with his life, war began. 1939, with the invasion of Poland, England declares war. They have sworn to support them. Um, in 1941, U.S. starts the Lend-Lease. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. December 8th, 1941, U.S. declares war on Japan. And at that moment, on the 11th, Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. Um, soon after, Churchill makes this famous quote, victory at all cost, victory in spite of all terror, victory however long and hard the road may be, for without victory there is no survival, and everyone feels the urgency of stopping Hitler. The Allies in this time, um, the Battle of Britain ends with a German defeat. 1941, Eisenhower is recalled to Washington after Pearl Harbor. Air attacks, the blitz continues in Britain. Russia tries to repel the Germans. 1942, the Soviets stopped Germans before Moscow. Germany is bogged down in Russia. 1943, Eisenhower promoted to full general. Invasion of North Africa, Sicily, and Italy surrenders. The Germans and Adolf Hitler at this time, the, Britain, the Battle of Britain. Hitler's final solution leads to the horrors and atrocities of the Holocaust. In 1940 and 41, Germany prepares the Atlantic Wall against the inevitable Allied invasion. Um, 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad, and 1943, Jun um, Germany surrenders at Stalingrad. So as the war in Europe continues, um, more and more American boys are being recruited into the army. And Jack realizes that uh, he feels as if it is his patriotic duty to enlist as well. So with two of his brothers, he heads to his local enlistment station and signs up for the Army Air Corps. So he's sent to Camp Roberts in California, where he completes the aviation cadet training program. And since he is educated, he's a college graduate, he moves to Hondo, Texas, where he completes a very intensive 18-week training program, upon completion of which he is um, awarded the rank of second lieutenant and given his navigation wings, meaning he can serve as a navigator in the war. Furthermore, uh, he continues to spend time there. He serves as an instructor in navigation for two years at Hondo. And then he returns home in 1943 for several months, where he buys, a mother a ha he buys his mother, who's divorced and elderly, a house um, with all this money that he's been saving up. And then at the same time, he falls in love with this girl named Mary and um, gets married on November 15th. His wedding was originally designated for December 3rd, but it has moved up two weeks because there are fears that he's going to be deployed soon. He actually moves up the street to 11th Avenue, is that right? Yep. yep. <laughs> All right, so Germany in the spring of 1948 4, Allied intelligence and misinformation systems are wildly successful. Germans were quite sure the Allies would land at Calais. Um, Calais, sorry, sent elite 15th Panzer Division there. German continues to reinforce the Atlantic Wall, and early reports of an Allied invasion, um, invasion at Normandy are discounted by Hitler. Eisenhower has the Operation Overlord that becomes the Normandy invasion. 
Um, through many, th there were many things that made it successful. First, strong leadership, meticulous planning, meticulous training, control of the seas, control of the skies, control of information and disinformation, and weather forecasting. They had better weather forecasters than the Germans. And these are the numbers of planes. When you imagine, if you can imagine 3,900 fighters, 16 or 70 gliders, they landed 2,300 paratroopers behind enemy lines before D-Day, the night before D-Day. 129,000 soldiers come in on that day. This is a letter that Eisenhower talking to the paratroopers preparing for that pre-D-Day jump. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well trained, well equipped, and battle hardened. He will fight savagely. And then at the end, I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech a blessing of Almighty God upon the great and noble undertaking. So here are a couple of the sites from the Atlantic Wall um, and where the D-Day invasion took place. So this is a um, part of the Atlantic Wall. It's an armament that's going to defend the beaches as the Allies storm. The top left is Utah Beach where we went and saw. Um, we're amazed by how far that these men had to travel across the flat, uh, soft sand. They had to travel like half a mile with artillery on them and a hundred pound backpack and these are these are boys. And, um, at Omaha Beach where there's huge cliffs behind it and there's no way they could make it up the cliffs. They just sent wave after wave into the artillery. Um, and the famous story of they, mad, they were able to go up the beach front and then around and captured it from the back because there was no way to make it up the cliffs. And then Point Du Hoc where um, the rangers climbed the cliffs as depicted in private, Saving Private Ryan. Um, so we went there and it was really humbling to see all these sites. And how strong the fortifications still were. Um, in fact, there was a hotel that's been built into the German fortifications. They used that as their, as their little bread and breakfast. Okay, so um, between December of 1943 and April of 1944, as the Allied leadership is beginning to plan the Normandy invasion to break the stalemate in Europe, um, Lundberg is deployed as part of the 8th Air Force to England. Um, he is assigned as the navigator for the 384th Air Brigade in the 381st Bombardment Group. And throughout his several months with, um, in which he was in England serving mi bombing missions over France and Germany and continent, uh, continental Europe, his main goals included bombing railway stations and air bases, generally weakening German defense and infrastructure and preparing for the invasion. And then before and after and during the invasion on D-Day, he flew missions um, assisting the troops as they made their way across the continent. Uh, one of the um, groups that he was likely part of was the Oster, the Oster Schleben, um, <laughs> um bombardment. Um, among many others. And by the time they had landed, they were able to pretty much make the, our, um, the what is the name of the German Air Force? Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe. I always have a problem saying it. But they pretty much made them so that there, they think there were three or four sorties over Normandy by them that day. So they pretty much disabled both the naval and the air war before the war. And Lundberg was a part of that. Okay, so on June 22nd, 1944, Lundberg took off as the navigator aboard the Spare Charlie in a bombing mission of a railway base which would continue to assist the Allied invasion. However, this mission would be Lundberg's last. As described um, by a young French girl, his plane was flying too low over a church. It was hit by a storm of flak from the German ACAC guns. Um, his plane split into two violently and he flew into a patch of reeds on the German side where it wouldn't be discovered um, until a year later. Um, so John, was, or John Lundberg was eventually interred in the Normandy American Cemetery, um, which is where the majority of those who died in the Normandy invasion were buried. Um, and uh, he was posthumously awarded an air medal with an oak leaf cluster by the president. Um, for his courage, coolness, and skill displayed in, bat displayed in battle, he was also posthumously awarded a Purple Heart. Um, and his efforts and bravery were critical to the success of the war. 
Um, as General Eisenhower concurred while standing in Normandy after the war, if I didn't have air supremacy, he said, I wouldn't be here today. So the Normandy invasion casualties, um, Germany, um, 210,000 missing, um, 30,000 killed and 80,000 wounded. We were able to attend, go to the German cemetery where because of the chaos of war after and the poverty of Germany, many were left in France to be buried there and there is a large German cemetery in France. Um, it, it shows the sacrifice of France in a way of accepting the dead. Um, the United States, 29,000 killed, 106,000 wounded and missing. And these are um, casualties from the whole invasion, so that would be until France. I mean, until Paris, sorry. And then um, United Kingdom, 11,000 killed, 50,000, 54,000 wounded. Canada, 5,000, 13,000 wounded. And in France, 12,200 civilians were killed and missing. And it also is a testament to the French people. Um, the, the Americans pretty much destroyed their cities in that section, and they still welcomed them. So battle deaths of all of the um, confirmed 60 million, we know for sure, were killed. Um, and that is just from the soldiers, well, battle deaths. Civilian deaths were another 45 million. Um, so many say 70 to 80 million are more likely um, of the battle deaths. But that doesn't count starvation in China, where there was probably 50 million that were killed. Um, so the numbers are, are a lot larger than I think what we see here as if they need to be. So we visited the Normandy American Cemetery. Um, it's very close to Omaha Beach and it's incredible just how many plain white crosses and stars of David that each represent, which we've come to realize, um, an individual with so much potential as vivid and unique as our silent hero, Second Lieutenant John K. Lumberg. Um, it's just still hard to imagine this, this figure of 85 million, but each of those 85 million represents someone just as unique with just as much potential as John K. Lumber. And it's just, you can't even imagine it would be a different world if all these young men and women and children, civilians who were affected by the war had lived. And um, by going there, it just really set in for me and Miss Ellingson. And one of the remarkable things I felt on the cemetery um, was also the, um, it felt American, which was really interesting going to France. And, and you go to the British cemetery, it felt slightly British, and the German cemetery was a, a totally unique experience. But it's interesting that um, how willingly the French were able to let the Americans come in, build this place, and, um, and remember. And, um, and you do, you're overwhelmed by the weight of the numbers. So Jack's final letter that he wrote to his parents in uh, May of 1944 was set to his family. Um, and his mother, in response to receiving this letter, um, wrote a poem to express her emotions. She wrote to him, Sitting here, Jack dear, sail on, sail on, kneel in prayer, and silence will never dim your step. And his mother was right, his words and memory do live on. His grandniece wrote a lengthy school paper about him, his final letter was displayed in a prominent, prominently in an exhibit in France about the Normandy invasion, and his words were later recited in a speech by our 43rd president, George W. Bush, um, to help us Americans remember the sacrifices that John K. Lundberg made and that every soldier in every war has made. Um, me and Miss Ellingson being here today is also proof that Jack's words and memories live on, his mother was right, and silence will never dim his step. So his sacrifice for our freedom, um, we're hoping, will never be forgotten. And, and that's the way I feel as well. It's been um, a remarkable experience, and I think that's what I came away with, is that sacrifice, what am I willing to do? You know, what have I given up to make things better? And um, it's good to have someone who was willing, and really note, he noted in his letter that he was willing to do that for the United States. And I think that's remarkable, at the, at probably one of the lowest moments of his life, that he thought the sacrifice was okay, it was good to do. All right. So we'd love to open it to any questions that you have. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, so she, so after uh, the letter was sent to her because she, she was his next of kin because they recently got married even though they'd only been married for a short period of time. So there's actually a little bit of family tension between her and Jack's mother about who would get his, um, his belongings, his medals, things like that. And so they were all initially sent to marry, but she soon married again only I'm not sure maybe five to ten years later. She married again. She has kids who live around the country. Um, and all of his medals besides his Purple Heart were eventually given to his mother and are now part of the Lundberg family. What happened to uh, his two brothers? Okay, so, um, they survived, yeah. so his other brothers both survived the war. Mm -hmm. One of them, Charles Lundberg, lived in Springville, Utah. He passed away, I think, three years ago. And we met with Charles's daughter, who was Lundberg's niece. Um, and she gave us a lot of, the, she gave us access to their family photo connection, collection, which was incredibly valuable. Um, and we heard a, a bunch of stories about their childhood and how Charles viewed his older brother, Jack. They had a remarkable family. Um, his sister went to Juilliard as a musician, um, lived with the mother for the rest of her mother's life. And then um, they politicians in Montana. Yeah, the, the, John's nephew is Tim Fox, who is the, was the Attorney General of Montana, and he just ran for governor, I think, in the last cycle. Yeah, they were, he was deciding to run. I, can't, I didn't check. Yeah. I should have checked. But anyway, yeah. Can you tell us about the research you did on Jack and like, where you were able to find things? You, you did it all before you went to France, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, except for the NARA research, the National Archives. Yeah. We were blessed, really. We were lucky because the Lundberg family had put a lot of stuff online, which we didn't know when we selected him. So we did get a lot of that from online. We also had his military file, his very large military IMPC, I think it's called. I, or, yeah, IDPF. His, I, okay. Yeah. I, I was very wrong. But we found it <laughs> with a lot of great information there. And that's how we found about the struggle over the medals. They save everything in the military. They saved every letter that each woman wrote. Um, it was kind of lovely, actually, that they saved it all, and how hard they tried to accommodate everybody. And there were some old uh, Salt Lake Tribune clippings mm -hmm. and eulogies of those who died, who were aboard his plane. Like he, there were, I, there was one who sur miraculously mm -hmm. survived, and was which, a prisoner of war. Uh, he was a prisoner of war, and then he came back and lived out his life. Unfortunately, he passed away, so we didn't get the opportunity to talk to him. But which is crazy, considering how violent their violently their plane exploded. He just got lucky. Mm -hmm. He ejected and his parachute. Yeah. It was him. almost an accident that he was yeah. out of the plane when it, when it blew. And then the, he was really kind to the mothers and families. He sent them personal letters about the last moments and um, exactly what happened and gave them a lot of closure. And also when we were at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., um, we looked at a lot of old photos from the, that our, we had a volunteer who pulled all these uh, resources for us. And we also went up to the microfilm room and it had a really thorough record of everything that happened in the 381st Bombardment Group. So every time someone died, every time someone got some illness or someone, someone yeah. did something silly, <laughs> every single thing was mentioned in that um, record. And it was super long and we only had a couple hours there so we didn't see Lundberg's name mentioned besides um, upon mentioning his death, but mm -hmm. we saw a lot of information about the daily life in Camp Ridgewell, which is where they were stationed in England. With all those Americans in the English countryside, <laughs> getting up to travel. <laughs> Jacob, if there was one, one moment that had a kind of a moment of I'd say going to the cemetery. So when we went to the Normandy American Cemetery, so basically the way this, this whole program was outlined was like in a way that just, I really liked the way it was outlined. So we spent like months from January through May every week like researching, writing papers about the war. A big major focus was learning about the Normandy invasion and things like that. We had like five hours of reading a week. And then in addition to our silent hero research, so we learned like a broad picture of it. Then we went to Washington, D.C., where we had like a one-week crash course. We had like four hours of lectures a day where we just like learn, like relearning everything, like understanding like what happened. And then we went to France, 
And the first day we visited some of the, we visited Longstrom Air, which is where the, bomb, the fortifications were. We visited Utah Beach, which was just like, that was my first time on a beach. And I just couldn't even imagine, like that's kids my age or a year older walking mm -hmm. up with, like as big as my suitcase was, my suitcase was like 40 pounds or whatever. Like two of my suitcases on my back walking a half mile with these German machine guns on me. So that was the first thing that just blew my mind. Um, they took us at the day with the tide, so the tide would be the same, so we would see the beach. Yeah. Um, and we were there when it was sunny, and it was horrible weather on D-Day. Um, Omaha Beach, it's like, we went up to the, where the machine gun nest is, and you can, one machine gun can just cover so much beach, and it's, uh, there's no way you could make it up that okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but I think the most powerful thing to me was visiting the cemetery. So the first cemetery we visited was the British Cemetery which they had little quotes, like, um, I think it was from a bank of quotes, but some of the families picked their own to put on the little headstones, which were super oh, duper yeah. powerful and, like, really inspiring. Then we went to the German cemetery, which was just incredibly conflicting, because mm -hmm. we see all these people who probably deserve to be remembered, probably had a family. Um, a lot of these were probably very good people who just got roped into a bad war. Some of them were ardent Nazis. Um, I don't remember his name, but one of the like, most hateful Nazis was buried in that cemetery, right among people who were probably good German citizens. So like, the design of that, that cemetery, that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, where I was getting with this the whole build-up was when we went to the Normandy American Cemetery on the last day, on the last real day of our trip. And so we go to the cemetery, there's 15 students, 15 teachers, and then maybe like six or seven professors and people running the program. And we go in there, and the way we begin is by laying a wreath at the children's memorial um, at the head of the cemetery. So the cemetery is designed, there's like 10, no, five, 10 plots, five, I think. So one, two, three, four, five back, and there's like a chapel in the middle. Um, and right at the start, there's the children's museum. So we were up there, and they had us line up, um, like students and teachers, two lines, and then someone with a wreath in the middle. And then they had us turn face the cemetery mm -hmm. where there's tens of thousands of graves and they had us sing the national anthem. Um, and there's like the, le the, own, the, the director of the cemetery there and it, like, the 30 of us who had just been working so hard to understand sacrifice in the war and our silent heroes standing there singing the national anthem, that was amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And then after that we had to walk around and listen to everybody's eulogy and then I was, I was the last, I was the 13th one out of 15. So it was just an exhausting, mm -hmm. an exhaustingly emotional day. So, because everyone was, thought their hero was the best, yeah. you know, and everyone felt that connection. Yeah, so that was the long version of that answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we were in for an adventure when we were on a, a, a meaningful adventure when we were on a bus and we got off at a gas station and we bought those really awful funny chips. Oh yeah, I can't even remember the names of them, but things that should never be chips. Grilled were chips. chicken chips. Yeah, grilled chicken chips. And this gentleman came up to me in the gas station, and he was not older than me, so he was, you know, 50-ish. And he said, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for the American sacrifice. And I thought, you know, you hear so much about. And then we did go to Paris for a few hours, and, you know, Paris is a whole different animal. But they are really, I mean, he had been taught that as well. So. Okay, yeah, and that reminds me of another story. <laughs> um, when we were at the cemetery, so after we've all given our eulogies, they're like, okay, you have about an hour to go just walk around and soak it in. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go say bye to Jack first. So I went over to his grave, and I was just sitting down by his grave. Um, and we're not allowed to be on the lawn. To, to, I mean, we are. We have a special we permit for this program. But nobody else is because they're undergoing maintenance. They had recently gotten a ton, a ton of rain and stuff, so they're maintaining it. So I'm out there. Um, and this man, uh, this American, yells to me from, he's over by the front, and he yells out across the field. He's like, hey, do you speak English? And I'm like sitting there with the grave, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, can I ask you a favor? And I'm like, okay. And he's like, come here. So I run over to him, and he pulls out a little cloth flag from his pocket, and he's like, I was a first responder at 9-11, and I had this cloth with me at Ground Zero. And it would mean a lot to me um, if someone who knew someone who died here, something like that, could take a picture with this flag at their gravesite. I was like, yeah. So I explained um, the Normandy Institute program to him, and he's like, okay, that sounds awesome. So I went over, I took a picture with his flag, and I gave it back, and we just had, that was just a really special connection for me, and I thought that was, that was pretty powerful.
where do you go from here? What's your next step? What's your career move? <laughs> that's, that's a big the question. The sky's the limit with Jacob. <laughs> we'll see. Let's get our presentations in, try to spread the word about Jack. We need a History Day topic. If anyone has any ideas about triumph and tragedy in history, I'd appreciate it. And we can't do Jack. <laughs> mm. yeah. But he is looking into all different sorts of colleges and programs. He's one of those individuals who's great at math, science, and the arts, so it's going to be tricky. He also plays tennis. I, can, I, can, I have his resume. <laughs> can I ask one more question? Uh, as, as you were doing research, um, did, did you find anything in the record that, that was different than what was in the family history or the family lore? Did you find anything to correct? Okay, so um, Purple Heart, it's not on record anywhere, With but the there's, a, there's a letter to his mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a letter to his mother that we have. It's a letter and it's like, okay, we, an, official an official letter from the, a major general. We officially wore John Keith Lundberg, second lieutenant John Keith Lundberg, a purple heart for blah, blah, blah. Um, so we know he has a purple heart. We're going to correct the government records And we're going to correct the government records for that. So that's one thing. I was surprised how little his family knew about the actual service, the actual what he was doing in the military. Yeah, they had no idea. They were like, yeah, we, we know he died, like, and that was it. They knew yeah. about how he died because and the letter. they were able to contact that. So that girl, so someone, the survivor, the, one who sur the man yeah. who survived from his flight, flew back to Normandy after the war and because it was crashed over Abbeville and he scoured the town and he's like, does anybody have a recount of what happened? Because he obviously didn't know exactly what happened because he was in the plane. But this young girl um, from Abbeville, France, described it to him. Um, and the Lundberg family was able to contact him, but that was pretty much the extent of the family's knowledge yeah. of his actual military service. So, Even the fact that he... The even his training and stuff, they didn't have as, uh, too much information. Yeah, we on. didn't find out that he was an instructor so, for two years until yeah. like a week ago. Yeah, so we continued like, doing uh, the research. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what? We could not figure out what he did with those two years of his life between the aviation cadet training program and deployment. We're like, he's yeah. on active service. Right. It's the middle of the war. He's not working. Where is he? Mm. And it turns out he was being an instructor. How did you get access to the military file? It was so thick. Did you have to have special? This is interesting, actually. Most of the military files were burned in a, in a fire. And uh, so there are many people that didn't get files. And um, we got our files. I actually asked because we got ours the first. And um, because there's groups of very interested World War II enthusiasts who have actually gone out and found them and stored them. And they don't even, one group doesn't really even trust the government. They'll, they're very careful about how they store them and stuff like that. And so we actually got ours from that group. They had found it and stored it. St. Louis. So, yeah, that's a tricky one. It's sad that we've lost so much. So how are you sharing all of this story with Jack's family? And, I mean, I know you need to share it at least a few times, yeah. but, like, what ideas do you have for, like, sharing it more broadly? Because I know his family is probably thrilled to know all of mm -hmm. this now. They, they've already, in, we're going in January, and we're going to meet with all their extended family, and they're going to have a big thing where we're going to present to them. Um, but we've stayed in touch with Ann Cronmiller, the, who is his niece, and um, we stay in touch quite well. I need to get a bunch of pictures back to her, too. But, um, so they've been very receptive and very interested. And it's interesting when they doesn't have as, you know, he didn't have children. So it's very, their extended family is very active in it, which is nice. Um, so that's how we're reaching out pretty much. But as far as like getting to as many people as possible, mm -hmm. we're just gonna see where our opportunities take us. I'll continue to, I'll always remember Jack and I'll continue to spread oh. his story whenever I can, so. We want to work with veterans groups. We'd love to present to a veterans group and, or a few. Um, we'd like to really, we want them to know that we see the sacrifice now. Okay, so thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.